I started out my career working on fire-killed trees and as such uh, got the nickname Ms. Deadwood. But uh, since I'm still here talking about it about 25 years later, I, I guess it wasn't all that bad. Uh, today I'm going to run through a few of the things that can happen after a tree um, or after a fire, and but also after insect attack. And uh, Ralph made mention of somebody uh, that's going to be talking about bugs and fire a little bit later on. So there might be a little bit of overlap, but hopefully not too much. Because in many instances, um, essentially, the fire and the insect attacks can be closely related. And I'm also going to be taking you all the way through from what happens after the smoke clears um, to the utilization of dead and dying trees. So basically what it might mean to forest products manufacturers. Okay. So why is it that we need to consider time following a fire or an insect attack? And a lot of it is based on your management objectives. You may have more time or you may have less time. So a dead tree is a dead tree is a dead tree, whether it's by fire or whether it's by insects. You know, essentially our ecosystems have both as a result of um, natural disturbance. And again, in many cases you can't really separate some of the fire losses from some of the insect losses. You might have one or you might have the other, but a lot of the times you basically end up with both. Mortality can result because of a fire, but even if a tree survives a fire, it's in its weakened state, it can also kind of send out an invitation for a free lunch to some of those beetles. And then they come in and they attack, and then they cause mortality if the tree didn't initially die as a result of the fire. So consequently, you get um, similar deterioration patterns. And one other thing I want to um, mention, that in this presentation, I'm basically going to be talking about standing trees and not downed woody debris. That has a whole different timeline um, of decomposition. So another disclaimer about this presentation is that basically I'm, talk I'm not talking about any sort of pre-existing conditions or any hidden defect. Um, so basically what that means for you is that knowing something about your stand conditions prior to, to death is helpful. Was there a lot of heart rot on that site or root rot? Because we're not talking about this when we talk about losses from fire. The deterioration and decay you see as a result of fire and insect generally works from the bark inward towards the pith. So what are some of the things that we might be looking for after a fire? Well, again, the insects, and they're kind of double agents. They will, as I mentioned, often kill a weakened tree, but they also act as hosts and bring in stain and decay fungi. Or, in boring into the tree, they can um, create an opening, a hole, for fungal spores to enter. There are some other uh, forms of loss that are time dependent, things like weather check and breakage. And then there are some that occur at the time of fire, and that would, that's um, some things like char. So because insects seem to cause the most damage, I'm going to talk about them first. Um, and again, they can either kill the tree directly, um, say like the current lodgepole pine infestation, or they move in while the trees are basically still smoking. Um, the insects in like the lodgepole pine infestation, it, they'll come in when the trees are stressed suppressed, overstock stands, drought, stick, drought stricken. So um, it's not just the fire that can pull, pull the beetles in and um, kill the tree and cause deterioration. There's several different kinds of beetles out there, and they all have their own tastes. The bark beetles, they kind of like fire damaged or drought stressed trees. They have specific moisture content or temperature requirements. Um, they kind of hang out you know, move into the inner bark. They, avo they avoid trees that have been dead for a year or more because the larvae basically need enough undamaged tissue to feed on. The ambrosia beetles, those are the ones that create those little small pinholes that you see um, a lot of times in lumber, and they can introduce a dark brown or a black stain. And they usually come in fast where there are recently dead or weakened trees. And what's interesting about the ambrosia beetles is that they bring in fungi. They introduce these fungi that they then feed, um, that um, they then use as a food source. The larvae use as a food source. And you have the wood borers, which are often considered the most destructive because they'll attack weakened and dead trees, and they go all the way into the heartwood. So these insects. Um, precede the fungal activity in 
in most cases, and in fact introduce it. So, as I mentioned before, the beetles can be a little bit fussy about not only what they attack, but when they attack. So, if there's a fire late in the season, sometimes it doesn't attract as many beetles. And it used to be that the ambrosia beetles wouldn't show up until the spring after a fire, but now I'm not so sure this is the case. Um, thick bark can be a deterrent, but it may also work to the advantage of some beetles by keeping the wood moist. Remember that they needed a little bit of fresh material, so if the wood's all dried out, then they're probably, or, or dead, they're not, those types of beetles might not enter. And then the location on the bowl. Um, Differences in bark thickness can result in differences in moisture content. So that would influence where in the bowls, bowl the beetles might attack. And then the amount and type of food that's available to them will um, determine um, who comes to visit. So just like different kinds of beetles, there's also different types of fungi. And the ones that are typically associated with fire kill um, are sap rot fungi and stain fungi. The bad news about the sap rot is that it negatively impacts mechanical properties of wood. And, but the good news is it's usually in the sap, which when you're making rectangular lumber out of round logs, that can get sawn off um, and so not really have much impact. Stain, on the other hand, while it's not desirable by many consumers, doesn't really affect the mechanical, proper, the mechanical properties, only if the appearance. So if you're making structural grade lumber, like two by fours or whatever, you're okay. But if you're producing appearance grade lumber, like shops and moldings, things where you want clear wood with no stain, you lose out really big time on that one. Um, but if the conditions are right for stain, they're generally also right for other types of fungi. So just like us, the fungi require certain things to thrive. And so along with their food sources, they obviously um, need some other things like moisture and oxygen. But, you know, if it's too wet, if it's too dry, if it's too hot, if it's too cold, there's always something to complain about. So from a product's perspective, that's why kiln drying is so important, especially of some of this fire kiln material, because once you decrease the moisture to a certain level, the, um, the fungi die. But if you give them the right conditions, you know, they'll just take off. So if you have some really warm weather, maybe 75 to 85 degrees, and you've got a little bit of moisture left in your sapwood, you better watch out because from the pith to the bark, you know, they might go, you know, as much as half an inch to two-thirds of an inch um, a week. And then up and down the, the bowl, they can go about almost two inches a week, they can move up and the stain will spread. So um, if you've ever seen the sprinklers in the log yards, while it does provide fire protection and dust abatement, um, it also, it's also on to help prevent uh, staining of the, some of the valuable logs. So yet another form of deterioration after the fire is gone is um, checking and cracking that occurs as the trees dry out. And from a manufacturing standpoint, weather check influences kind of the product volume that can be produced. It'll inf influence how they can, can saw up a log or, you know, if you're peeling veneer, you're obviously not going to be able to get a full sheet. But you have to also keep in mind that the less volume you have to sell, the less money you're going to make. So it's kind of almost a, a double whammy. It's not always all about the quality. Uh, the chip market, it's not um, as impacted by this. Although when the trees are really dried out, it often makes it hard to chip. Uh, sometimes they end up with more fines. So it can be troublesome to have, have really dry material that sometimes forces them to kind of um, re-wet the logs, resaturate the logs. So there's several factors that determine why a tree um, might develop cracks, again, the, it, the size, where it is, the, the, the butt log or the top log, how thick the bark is, how hot the fire was, but also from a heat perspective, what's the temperature on your site, and then as well as um, some of the environmental conditions. And then there are some other loss factors like breakage. Um, this tree faller is kind of wondering why 
this tree chose to break and why it chose to break on his truck. Um, basically, breakage occurs because of some sap rot, soil erosion, or maybe combined with some of the pre-existing conditions. Uh, breakage can occur in logging when you're felling a tree um, or skidding it to the yard. Uh, can also be um, happen in handling in the mill yard. Uh, on the debarker, so it can happen anywhere um, along the way. Just want to add that this was one of the studies that um, I worked on, and unfortunately, this poor guy didn't make it home for dinner that night. Uh, people always seem to mention char, obviously, because if they go into a fire kill stand, they usually end up with um, black all over their hands or their clothes. But you know, generally, char doesn't appear too far into the tree. Um, if you have a really thin bark species, um, or maybe young trees with thin bark, you're going to get some charred wood. Um, sometimes, again, on these smaller trees, these small branch studs might burn into the bowl. But, and you get, um, a, you know, on these smaller trees too, you'll get a little bit of charring on the, the external part of the bowl, the outside. But for the most part, char isn't that big of an issue. However, if you want to make clean chips, a pulp chip out of it, um, char could definitely be a deal breaker if they see um, any of it in there coming into their yard. So after the fire is gone, how do you know a tree is dead? Um, you know, is the, maybe you're looking up and there's still some green. Um, is the tree going to recover, do you think? Is it going to die? Are there some clues that might help guide you as to whether it's going to make it or not? So there's some research that's been, quite a bit of research actually, that's been done. Um, and so to aid in planning efforts, uh, there's various publications out there. Here's just an example of one of them um, on ponderosa pine and dug fir. Um, and some of the things that they, were, they um, found were that some of the primary variables to help you predict uh, whether your tree's going to make it or not are the crown scorch volume and the crown consumption volume. And then some of the other things to think about are, again, the size of the trees, whether or not beetles have um, shown up, the ground fire severity, because that will impact the roots, um, which, you know, we do, the below ground portion is not something we, we see, so we don't really have any way to judge, um, except by the severity of the fire, what might have happened to the root system. And then um, the bowl, bowl scorch height. There's data, uh, there's research and publications on other species as well. There's a lot of data out there um, that you can, can access to help you predict mortality. You can already see that there's a lot of related things that's going to influence what's going to happen in a tree, and one formula doesn't fit all. Uh, I, I mean, I always feel pretty bad having to start my answer with when somebody asks me, um, you know, what's happening with this tree? Well, you know, it kind of depends on a lot of things. So what are some of the things? Well, many are related to um, the tree itself. So if we're looking at species and we have a ponderosa pine tree, well, they tend to have a lot of sapwood and pretty thick bark. And for the most part, um, oops, can everybody hear me? Is there something going on, Ralph? No, I can hear you fine. OK, I just heard some, a message just popped up about experiencing network connections. OK. Nope. Um, okay, great. Um, so, uh, so we're looking again at this ponderosa pine tree. It has lots of sapwood. It has pretty thick bark. Maybe the bark is a deterrent to some beetles or fungi, but maybe because it's thick and hasn't cracked, there's enough moisture in there that it's it's inviting others to kind of come in and, and share the love after the fire. Um, so you have a larger diameter tree. Well, then chances are pretty good it might be older, so it has again has thicker bark, which you know could be a deterrent and may not be a deterrent. But you could also have like a fast growing large diameter tree that det will deteriorate faster than a slow growing smaller tree because of the rate of the gr rate of growth and the moisture content um, um, to it. So lots of things um, that are related to the tree. So. Uh-oh. I can't let's see. That's not working. There we go. OK. Um, so within a tree. So now, you know, looking among trees, some of the differences. Well, let's look like within a tree. And so even within a tree, you've got some things going on um, that'll influence what type of deterioration the tree might experience. Um, 
different parts of the stem. So your diameter is decreasing as you go up, your sapwood width, um, your age, it's getting younger, you've got more juvenile wood, you've got thicker bark at the bottom than at the top, you know, kind of growing faster up there in the crown. So that's why, you know, you might find the rot lower down in the tree and then more weather checking happening up top. Just a few pictures here to show how species and, say, proportion of sapwood influences um, the amount of stain that you'd be seeing. So in the upper left, there's a true fir um, at one year that, you know, you don't see a whole lot of stain, but you see a very distinctive stain circle there um, in the middle photo. And then you look at the ponderosa pine in the lower right, and you see a lot, a higher proportion of stain, like most of the sapwood being stained there. So other things you may need to consider are your site characteristics, because that can also impact the requirements of the different ages, uh, different agents, like, you know, some of the, how picky some of the beetles were about the moisture and the temperature. So say you're on a north-facing slope, maybe the temperature is a little lower, you, your snowpack might linger a little bit longer uh, in the spring, uh, maybe your trees are experiencing slower growth. When you get to some of the higher elevations, you might have slower growth, but more intense sunlight, it might be hotter up there, um, hotter um, that high up. Or if you're on a very steep slope, you're not getting kind of di direct um, sunlight to, say, the bowl of the tree. So, those are other things that you that need um, that um, should be thought about, and the severity of the disturbance can also be impacted. Um, is also uh, an impact on what happens. This, uh, that was one of those factors that was used in predicting uh, mortality, but the severity will also uh, impact char in your trees, um, as we saw from that the uh, really badly burned um, lodgepole in that one picture. And one of the situations that's been noted in recent years, um, and it's as far north as Alaska and some other places, and um, maybe you'll, he, actually I want to, I'll listen in on that bug webinar to hear what they think, uh, what the current theories are. But um, it's rather than just, it used to be maybe one generation of beetle would be produced in, the, in a summer or in a year. But the lack of freezing temperatures has allowed like second broods to be um, to hatch, thus increasing the likelihood of mortality and also the um, the amount of deterioration. So it used to be that if you had a fire, say, late in the fall and then you had a cold or wet winter, it bought you some time from a utilization standpoint, um, like the ambrosia beetles that used to patiently wait until spring. Well, again, we're not so sure that, that uh, this is the case anymore. So there's other impacts along the food chain. Um, when the beetles reproduce and the grubs are out there, they become food for the birds. So the birds go in there after the grubs, and they peck on the trees, and you can see these, the nice spiral pattern on this one. And so not only are they getting food, but then they're also introducing stain and decay fungi from their, their beak. So it's kind of this um, little circle of life thing going on. So I've been asked how many years before a tree isn't worth salvaging or harvesting for products. Um, and in fact, there have been lawsuits over this. Maybe some of you out there have been involved in those. And so um, do we have one year? Do we have five years, 10 years? Um, why is it that we need to know? So basically, we want to know because obviously, we, want to hope, we hope to manufacture the logs into wood products. Um, so I'm going to give you some information on that. So when you're considering salvage logging, there's two things you need to think about. Is you, have to, you have to calculate kind of how much volume you think you're going to be losing. And, but the second thing is you also have to know how much value you're going to be, be losing. So, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the value is a function of both volume loss and also um, value loss. So, um, um, so the and then so that the type of milling structure infrastructure you have can also influence how much time you have. Again, are you manufacturing structural lumber, two by fours, or uh, where stain doesn't really matter, um, but strength and stiffness do, or are you manufacturing appearance grade lumber, where like shops and moldings, where you want clear lumber um, with no stain um, and no wormholes.
So it seems like a lot of the big fires in the late 80s caught people's attention. And, you know, or maybe that's just because it was one of the first projects I was assigned to and I came to work at PNW. Anyway, um, PNW Station has done a number of studies on fire and insect killed timber dating back to the 50s and 60s. But it seemed like in the late 80s there was kind of a renewed interest at a larger scale. And um, one of these uh, first ones was following the fires um, in 1987, where we ended up looking at volume loss. So some of you may remember the Silver Fire Complex. Um, again, people started thinking that maybe it was time to update research data on deterioration losses that had been done back in the 50s by Kimmy and Furness. So we were able to go to eight different sites three years in a row um, in southern Oregon and, and northern California. And what we did was we sampled four different species. We were able to um, look at um, those species over all three years. And we tried to get about 50 trees uh, for in each of those. With, but, and note the age range between 50 and all the way on up to 400 years. And then the DBH, the lowest was 10 inches, but again, it went up to, to um, almost 60 inches, which, you know, these days you're probably, and especially on the east side, you're probably dealing with younger and um, smaller trees. But we did try to get some small diameter trees in this study. Uh, this was strictly a um, volume. Uh, we didn't do a product recovery uh, study where we didn't take these logs all the way to the mill. We just looked at the basic effects of fire on the trees and the scaling volume loss. So there was no value loss assigned to this. And basically we felled the trees in the woods and we had Forest Service and BLM scalers provide volume deductions for essentially sap rot and weather check. And some of the results there, you can see um, that we didn't, uh, don't even show year one because there really wasn't much measurable loss that first year. But in year two, you can see the pink is the sap rot, and again, by species, Doug Fur Trooper, and the percent of cubic volume lost from the log um, in each of, for each of these for the sap rot and the weather check. And you can see by year three here that we had the sap rot was much, much more prevalent, almost um, 25, 26 percent on average for all the species was the cubic volume lost from the sap rot. And the weather check increased slightly, but, but there, wasn't, there was a lot of variation in that. We noted uh, whether or not stain was present, but because it doesn't count in volume loss, um, we, don't, we didn't include it in the graphs and the data because it wasn't a scaling deduction. So again, here's another, you know, ponderosa pine with a high proportion of sapwood that's been stained after, um, after one year. So we were talked, uh, I talked a little bit about how tree diameter or log, in this case, log diameter influences deterioration. So here's how you see how the log size and also the species can impact your volume loss. Um, and while mills can process small logs, they typically like an average small in diameter, somewhere around 10 inches, to um, basically to break even. So you can see here that the trooper and Doug fir um, kind of fell out together, and then the pines um, kind of lumped together in terms of cubic volume loss, uh, percent of cubic, cubic volume loss. And you had a lot of loss, a very steep loss, you know, up until probably around 15 inches, and then it starts leveling out a little bit. Another way we looked at the data had to do with how many cull logs that you might expect to see a few years out. And uh, that was a little telling, so that you could actually just pull that volume right out if you're planning a salvage sale or something. And so there are uh, based on um, species and based on log small end diameter, you could determine what proportion of your the logs from that stand might um, turn out to be to be cull. And you can see the sugar pine um, after um, by year three, really um, you had lost a, a good proportion of your of your material.
we did a mini study on Douglas fir looking at its mechanical properties because Douglas fir is very is highly valued for its structural properties. And so we took some a sample of chunks. Basically, we found um, on each log we cut out pieces that had con where we saw conks and where we didn't see conks, and we cut some small clear samples from them and had them tested uh, at. Uh, Oregon State University. And one of the things just to kind of look at or note from this is that the decrease in uh, density and stiffness and strength at the surface was a lot greater than on the interior towards the pit. So showing or illustrating the fact that the um, deterioration from fire actually moves from the outside in. Another study that was done by the Forest Service looked at um, wood changes, again, strictly volume loss um, in um, eastern Washington, and this is uh, Hadfield and, and Magelson. And again, they noted that there was lots of variation both between and within a species. So kind of all the things that um, I mentioned earlier um, that you need to be thinking about. They also had a, a wider range of species that were representative of the area. So there's a list of the species that they looked at. And here's an example of the type of thing that they reported, what happened. Um, basically, they were giving, uh, providing a picture of the progression of deterioration in trees so that you can see that there was still little stain in the dug fir after two years. By year three, all the sapwood. Um, year four, that was when they started noting some top breakage. Um, one thing in their publication, though, they didn't use standard scaling methods when they were calculating their losses. And again, they didn't do any product recovery studies to see the influence on product. So now let's add products into the mix of things and take a look at the relationship of volume um, and value loss. Again, a quick review. Volume loss is a function of the extent of deterioration. Value loss adds in the function of what products are you going to be making. Different products um, require different species, different sizes. Um, each have a different market value. So down here, um, where we're looking at a slash pile that probably isn't worth a whole lot, as we get to some uh, larger trees as the size increases and we get better quality logs, um, you, they become higher values. So your slash, you can be used for energy production, like heat and energy, um, hog fuel type thing, whereas when you get to some larger logs, you might be able to saw them into structural products or, pe or appearance products, or you might be able to peel it to veneer, into veneer. Um, I put chemicals in green here. That's an emerging, there's some emerging technology going on there where uh, you might be able to use some of the slash for higher value, uh, higher value chemicals. So on that y-axis, we had increasing resource um, quality. What are some of the uh, requirements? Well, for hog fuel, you can use almost anything. Uh, particle chips and fiber, again, they probably don't want any char or much stain. A structural product, no decay. An appearance product, no stain or, or decay. So you can see that, obviously, as you increase the value of the product, the quality of the resource has to be better. And the size of the resource also will impact um, the uh, what you're going to manufacture. So size does matter. Here's a basic tree bowl uh, showing shown in various diameters. And so the selects and the shops, well, that's the higher value stuff. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from the outer portion of the trees. And it comes from the outer portion of the bigger trees, because you, you might not get any selects from a mid-sized tree. And from a small tree, you're not going to get um, basically any. So it's mostly here in the larger trees, in the butt log, um, that's going to be the value of part of your tree. But alas, that's also where the blue stain and the sap rot tend to occur. So just so uh, you now see where, um, how the size can Im influence your, your recovery. So about the same time as the silver complex fire, 
Um, a summer fire occurred in the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area back in 1988. Because the, the ponderosa pine is so valuable, the landowners and the local mill were interested in how to value the timber and how much volume and how much volume, volume and value were lost after only one year. So just like the Silver Complex fire, what they found is very little volume loss was noted in the one-year dead material. But there was a different story for value, as you can see here. So the live are the light blue, and the dead were the pink, and the grade one logs. And so the, for the grade one logs, the highest value, they went from about $800 per, cubic, uh, per 100 cubic feet net scale down to about uh, under, a little under 500. And so you can see that was the story until basically you got to the cull logs, where it didn't really matter if it was live or dead. So their conclusion was basically there was no difference in scale defect amount, but the loss in value from live to dead was about 17%. Well, I can see that maybe some of you are thinking to yourself, hey, I have to pay more for blue stained lumber. What's the deal here? Well, sometimes it's being marketed as designer wood. I've seen blue stained lumber um, called denim wood in some of the products and things like that. But the producer isn't quite so lucky because they actually get less because they, they can't get a, a, a complete supply of it. So they end up delivering it in a mixed load and um, therefore brings the value down. I'm going to head north and I'm going to talk a little bit about beetle kill trees um, here. And just like in predicting mortality, we were wondering if there were any visual clues or characteristics um, you can use to determine what's going on. Because in this, the project I did in Alaska, they didn't, we didn't know when the trees had died. So we kind of had to come up with an alternative method. So we just put some classifications in based on what the tree looked like and whether they still had any green needles, whether the needles were turning brown, red, um, whether the bark was starting the, to come off, whether what kind of the color of the tree, um, and whether uh, you know weather checks had started. Um, so going out and let's see if if this can help predict uh, what your product product mix is going to be. Well, to some extent it worked. Um, you can see here, here's the class one, the live and the kind of the fading trees, and then the rest of the classes. And industry tends to like 90% standard and better lumber, so kind of this pink thing. So you can see that the once the tree was looking kind of brown, red, and um, starting to lose some of its fine twigs, that you weren't getting that 90% standard and better that industry would, would need. Um, so uh, the technique didn't, um, I wanted to just say that this technique didn't work very well for me when I tried to use it this fall when we were out cutting firewood. And um, my husband complained about uh, cutting down uh, a few too many trees that had a little bit too much rot in them. So. Anyway, uh, from there, I'm going to look at some uh, take you into some um, beetle killed ground fern, dug fir, some different species in a different location, John Day, Oregon, and looking um, at the dug fir, some of the dug fir um, results. You can see that if the mills are producing structural lumber from the live um, the live trees, you can see that the structural lumber uh, standard and better. I mean standard and better lumber, that from the live trees, they were getting close to that 90%. But in the dead material, you can see they were only getting about 50% standard and better, that they were getting a lot more of the lower grade utility um, and economy. And then, of course, there is also, you can see a little bit of a diameter effect here in terms of um, if the high high uh, grade lumber, the select structural, you can see as you get into the larger logs that you're getting more of the select structural, both in the live and the dead material. And so here's looking at the cubic recovery percent, um, lumber recovery percent for the Douglas fir over time, the blue line being the live, two years, 
um, the pink line, the middle line, and three to four years. So you can see that it decreases uh, as time since death increases. So there are some differences in cubic recovery percents. But when you looked when they looked at the value differences in terms of dollars per hundred cubic feet of gross log scale, basically once the tree was dead again, the two to four year dead was worth roughly about $120 per hundred cubic feet less than the live sample. So while the, vo while the volume loss um, differed in years since death, it didn't really make it, um, as much difference as the value loss. So wormholes are another fact of life in dead trees. And while lumber in wormholes may look really good in a rustic cabin, uh, I would think that most consumers, like myself, would probably avoid selecting a piece of holy lumber if I had an alternative. Unless, of course, you wanted that look. And then, of course, just like the blue stained pine, you get to pay extra for that. So PNW uh, was contacted by the um, National um, Forest Service Measurement Specialists and Collins Pine after the Warner fire um, in southern Oregon down in Lakeview. And they were concerned about what was happening so soon after the fire. Um, the fire was out. Three months later, uh, I went on a tour down there. And basically, we were seeing blue stain and flathead borers. Um, already had moved in. They were able to salvage some of the trees within a year. Um, it, seemed, it seemed pretty optimistic to me when they were proposing it, but um, luckily it all went through. And so we were able to do a study with them. And what I saw really surprised me uh, in comparison to what I had seen a decade earlier on the Silver Complex fire. Uh, so the National Measurement Committee was decided, like, do we really, do we need some additional log rules now for, for all these wormholes because you know, of all the damage they're causing? Our log sample, uh, it was pretty hard to find a green sample um, because it was a salvage sale. But we were, into get, we were able to find a few and also get um, some of the smaller trees uh, that you find on, on those sites. But after one year, you can see when you open up a log, how far in to the log the stain, um, you know, the stain had penetrated. And then as you look at the lumber, you can see the worm, how the wormholes were showing up, and um, the amount of and the amount of stain sometimes throughout the whole the whole piece of of lumber. So why does this matter? Well, let's check out the differences in prices between stained um, stained material. So if you have molding in better, that's $1,600 per um, thousand board feet. If you have stained material, you only have 300. Even the difference between shop material and stained is pretty great. So this is what you're looking at, $850 per thousand versus 300 and about $325 per thousand. So the short story is that the presence of the beetles and the, the uh, stain that uh, went along with them you know, was basically an indication of a lot of stained wood. So you can see from the control sample, which is the dark blue, that there was a little over 10% of the molding and better and quite a bit of, of shop lumber, whereas the logs that had the worms in them, uh, they showed up here in the stain or they put them into the structural lumber where stain didn't matter and the wormholes don't matter either. So even with those price differences, then you can kind of look at the volume and you really see that there isn't, um, you see that there isn't much volume loss as a result of the worms and the uh, stain being present. But when you look at the value difference, you can see, especially when you get into the, the larger um, diameter logs, you can see just how much value is lost um, per thousand board feet of green lumber tally. So I'm getting ready to wrap up here. And most of what I've talked about today you can find um, in this publication. Um, and so in it's an update of a previous kind of synthesis that we did. 
but we tried to provide some guidance on whether it's worth um, pursuing any active management in fire and insect kill, uh, killed stands and using some of the visual clues, uh, kind of a photo guideline. And then there's also a sheet, a worksheet for assessing post-disturbance changes and what that means for management. And then there's some reference photos that you can use um, as well. But just a reminder, um, there's a lot of factors that's going to help determine what happens to your tree after the fire is gone, and so, and uh, one size doesn't fit all. So thank you.